Okay, welcome um, for the folks here on the Zoom call and to anyone um, practicing with us later on YouTube. Thank you for tuning in to this practice. Uh, my name is Jill Davey. And uh, I was um, inspired today by a little um, se segment on CBC radio that a show called Tapestry that I really love and often find inspiration for uh, little Dharma talks here um, from, from some of the topics that are covered there. And uh, Mary Hines, I believe, is the interviewer. And, and today she was interviewing an author, uh, J.B. McKinnon, and um, he's written, I think he has five or six books, and one of them is about the 100-mile diet, which encouraged people to start to eat and shop locally. So he's written several very influential, important um, pieces, and I'll just um, put his website link um, It'll be below in the YouTube channel, and I'm also uh, putting it here for um, folks on the on the Zoom call. Um, so his new book is called "The Day the World Stops Shopping." <laughs> wow, what a visionary! <laughs> I can't even imagine. And yet, as they were pointing out in the interview, you know. He was starting to have these conversations in in a few years back uh, with with people uh, and contemplating this beginning this process of the book, you know, uh, and it seems like such a that he calls it a thought experiment to imagine the day the world stops shopping, and um, but but and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> And it was like, you know, it didn't take us long to find a way around it and like to, you know, all get on board with online shopping or whatever. But um, for a time there, it was surprising how, yeah, we can actually buy so much less and stop doing so much busyness and so much doing and all of that. So I won't go into the whole thing of, around, um, I'll put the link for this CBC uh, for that interview. So you could listen to that, the fullness of that interview and the link to his website with his books. Um, but there was one part that stood out to me in particular in his uh, study and preparation, there's a better word, research. <laughs> researching for the book um he went to visit sado island in japan s-a-d-o and uh interviewed a good number of people there and was introduced to this japanese word yutori um i'll put that here it's it's y-u-t-o-r-i and i uh, in no way, in no way, claim to know anything about Japanese culture or Japanese language at all. So this is just based on what I've heard in the interview and a little bit of research of other definitions of this word concept. And but really more about what it sparks for me and reminds me in the teaching of the Dharma and the practice of the Dharma. Um. So a lot of folks apparently at this island, Sado Island in Japan, have moved there, or some, I don't know how many, from Tokyo. And so he was talking about, in the interviews, people sharing this sense of uh, a lack of yutori in Tokyo life, which is very full and busy and like 
like it would be in New York or Toronto or whatever, um, compared to this, their experience of living on this island. And so this word Utori, he said, is rough, translates roughly as space. And in the interview, he talks about it, it has many, it could be used in many different ways in different sentences um, and applied in different con contexts. So it could, this space could refer to the amount of time, free time. And he was saying like it was even the, even the ability to find people to interview, it was like, yeah, sure, I've got time, come on over. It was so easy to connect with people where he's like in the city, it's like, oh, I can maybe see you in October, you know? And so that was one thing of this, this thing of spaciousness of time. Uh, and then I'll just make another connection there. The poet, Naomi Shahib, let me get her name properly. Where's her name? Na Na Naomi Shahab Nai. I knew I was saying it wrong. Um, was introduced to this word, this concept of Utori by a Japanese student um, who, who also spoke about this in terms of poetry and just letting a word be with you for a day. And just having space around it and seeing how what it evokes and how it lands or this space of after you read a poem and just let it be just and let the poetry evolve and teach you what it has to show you and i'm just reminded by a, a student friend that was recently uh, writing a piece and just gave it like all kinds of space to let the meaning come and evolve and transform and and how uh, beautiful and wise that was. Um, so it can this can be some of the meanings. It also can refer to a sense of material security. Um, and then he he said mostly most people what he spoke to on the island talked about it as space in their hearts. Just, just such a lovely phrase, just that, like space in the heart is just saying those words evokes that feeling for me of, ah, yeah, it just says it all, space in the heart, and you know, which can often be in a place of contraction or protection or fear or doubt or, um, tightness and hmm, to just feel like there's space to be with how things are is uh, a liberating wisdom. Uh, they also referred to space, the, the space to give time. There is an aspect of generosity to it, to give our time that we have enough time to give to others, to show up for things. They talked about that it, it could also be used like in arriving early enough that you have time to feel into a place or explore a place before a meeting or whatever is going to happen there. Um, also the space to give your wisdom or your thoughts or presence with someone um, and space to give possession. So it, it seems to have a, this connection with generosity. Um, and then in my, you know, very mm, minimal Google search of a little bit more around this, this Yutori, um, another place said that it's a, uh, they referred to it as a noun, it's a verb or a noun apparently, but it, it said a subjective sense of well-being in daily life. That's so beautiful. And it's, connects to me with that sense of generosity, that sense of space in our hearts, this sense of um, not feeling rushed and crushed and hurried is, can really give us a sense of well-being in, in daily life. 
Um, and then some other literal definitions of it are like literally just elbow room, having space, <laughs> enough space, um, leeway, um, an allowance, room, time, and a sense of spaciousness. <clears throat> so, yeah, similarly, I mean, the English word of space or spaciousness could can be applied in lots of different contexts and lots of different meanings. But uh, as a meditative practice, I've found it wonderful and really supportive and I would say onward leading to practice intentionally with spaciousness which can lead to an awareness of an experience of emptiness when we, and it's kind of for, can be an accessible way to the, towards the experience of emptiness. Um, so we'll kind of, uh, explore this in our practice tonight uh, yeah I think that's all I need to say for an introduction to why this inspired me um, there was one other piece here so yeah that the poet one of my a really wonderful poem poet Naomi Shihab Nye was talking being interviewed by Krista Tippett on the On Being project which is a wonderful series of podcasts and um so I'll just read this 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 is how Naomi encountered this word Yutori uh she said I just came back from Japan a month ago and in every classroom I would just write on the board, you are living in a poem. And then I would write other things just relating to what we were discussing or doing in the class. Um, but she found the students very intrigued by discussing that. And they would say like, what do you mean we're living in a poem or when all the time or just when someone talks about poetry? And Naomi replied, no, when you think when you're in a very quiet place, when you're remembering, when you're savoring an image, when you're allowing your mind calmly to leap from one thought to another, that's a poem. That's what a poem does. So this is what she meant by that phrase, you're living in a poem. And so the students liked that. And in fact, one of the girls, um, from this class in Japan wrote wrote her a note on the day she was leaving school and she said well here in Japan we have a concept called yutori and it is spaciousness it's a kind of living with spaciousness for example and this is the that I mentioned earlier it's leaving early enough to get somewhere so that you know you're going to arrive early so when you get there you have time to look around Wow, <laughs> I have to work on that one. Or, and then she gave all these different definitions of what Yatori was to her. One of them was, and after you read a poem, just knowing you can hold that you can be in the space of that poem and it can hold you in its space and you don't have to explain it. You don't have to paraphrase it. You just hold it and it allows you to see differently. And I just love that. I mean, I think that's what I've been trying to say all these years. This is what Naomi is saying. Yeah, so I just wanted to um, offer her words there and her experience of how she came to hear this word as well. Okay, now that's enough. <laughs> yeah, so find a posture that 
maybe you had some elbow room and feel spacious for you or um, laying down, uh, standing up, walking. I did some nice walking meditation today. It was really lovely. Hmm. Just taking out of time. <clears throat> yeah, so as you're settling into your place of practice, your posture, whether it's reclining, standing, walking, or sitting, in the context of this spaciousness meditation, it can be helpful to take some time, if you choose, to have your eyes open for a few moments and to actually look in your space where you are and see the space between the body and the wall. Sometimes we get so used to looking at the object that we're not seeing, sensing, feeling the space. If you have a window, you might look out the window and see a sense of even more space between trees, between horizon, whatever is in your view, another building perhaps. And then you can have a sense of the space all around you on the wall to wall behind you or so often because the eyes are in the front we're so focused on looking forward but you maybe can feel there's space behind you unless you're laying down yeah so so feel free to use that visual sense to connect with the space that is here between objects Space is also within all the objects, but we won't get into metaphysics. And then if or when your system feels comfortable, you could rest the eyes. You can rest them in a slightly open way or closed, whatever best suits your practice and your nervous system whatever you're used to or feel comfortable with. Eyes closed or just softly resting and slightly open. And then we can just, as we're arriving into our posture, feel into the gift of space that you've given yourself by showing up for practice. A time to unplug and to slow down and to leave aside other distractions and to drop into just being. And with this sense of the relationship of time and spaciousness or space. Perhaps a moment to reflect on your day. And sometimes we can feel like the day was so full, so busy. I did this and then to this and this and this. And see if you can connect with the sense of some space between, around, in and through your day. And if there's a sense that there isn't much of that for you usually, then maybe there's an intention that arises to create and invite spacious time.
And then we'll really land here in the body in the center of this moment, dropping down through your spine to your sits bones or to your feet or to the whole back body, depending on what posture you're in. Just taking and allowing this spacious time to let the body settle into stillness, softness, presence. Softening or widening, giving space around any tensions that have accumulated through the day. So in the next few moments of silence, just take, allow checking into the places of habit tension in the body and feeling spaciousness around them. So a sense of width and length and height and depth and, and see if some of the contraction eases or dissipates a little bit just with that connection to space. Let's do that together now. And then continuing a little more in this, connecting with the body, feeling into this spaciousness, the space that is here within this form that feels so solid and permanent at times. And we can feel the space within the shape of ears, nostrils, mouth. This space that we know is present within the body, in the cells, in the tissues, in the organs. And the spaces between the fingers and the toes and the legs and arms, space from between the torso and shoulders and head, the armpits, behind the knees, the spaces all around the body in relation to other parts of the body.
And for these next few minutes of silence, you can just stay with this sense of feeling and knowing the space in and around the body. Or you could attend to the space in the breath. For some people, this exploration makes the breath tighter and isn't helpful. For others, it may be. At the end of the exhale and before the next inhale, there's small space. Again, if that's creating tension in the breath, then just stay resting with spaciousness in and around the body. And as we rest with the body or body breathing, we may get a glimpse or a little sense of some space between thoughts. And then gently inviting awareness to rest in the area of what can be called the heart center or chitta, heart mind. Generally considered to be in the area of the center of the chest, the aware heart, heart of awareness. And feeling into a sense of space in our hearts or around our hearts. And even if it feels like there's contraction, grief, fear, anger, 
Can we allow some space with that, around that? Not needing to push anything away or hold on to anything. And we may notice at times how words and thoughts and wanting and not wanting rushes in to fill the void or the space sometimes. And to not create more pushing around that, but just to let that also be spacious, like, oh, this is just passing through and then let there be space around it. And now as we stay resting in this area of the chitta, the aware heart, with a gentle, spacious awareness, can we also have a sense of the space in the room around us without needing to look at it? We were looking before we rested the eyes and now we can just feel and know and recall the space around us, even as we stay resting with the body and the heart. As we continue resting in this space, you may be able to have some sense of the space beyond the room you're in or the space you're in. Perhaps other parts of the building if you're indoors or a sense of beyond the space outside of the building. You can just recall what's around or just feel into or just know. Sense of sky, of horizon. Nature. In all directions. Behind. In front. Side to side. Above. Below.
Allow the body, heart, mind to soften into, widen into some of that space. Not, not separating or losing a sense of the body here and now, but just widening, softening into the space around us. Relaxing into it. In these last few minutes of silence together, see if there's a, a sense of well-being in this connection with you, Tori, with spaciousness. Well-being. In a moment, I'll ring the bowl three times. Take your time, allow space around the sounds, and when the third sound ends, gently ending your practice.
Mm. Thank you for joining us. If you practiced with us on the YouTube recording, uh, check the links down below. I'll put the interview to the on being and to um, J.B. McKinnon's website and uh, to the CBC uh, tapestry interview um, um, will be there. So thank you.